Hi there, thanks for joining us. This is a Q&A edition of Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley. Coming up, uh, we're going to look at a lot of issues, one involving dark matter. Um, this question, though, uh, comes about as a consequence of someone who wasn't real happy with a, a discussion we had recently. So we'll, uh, we'll um, certainly reinvestigate that. Uh, we'll also look at flawed mathematics. That sounds like my entire school career. Uh, we'll also be discussing black holes and gravity and energy in space. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us again to sort all of this out is Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Um, let's get into those questions, eh? Yes. Uh, let's just let's just hit the nail on the head and start. And uh, this first question uh, comes about as a consequence of us uh, answering a previous question. And I, I think we've kind of put uh, Kevin's nose out of joint just slightly. I might say, though, he's he's used a word that I, I think is probably not in keeping with uh, the way you deal with things, Fred. I would never, ever accuse you of being glib. However, that said, uh, Kevin does have issue with the dark matter, matter question. Now, so that I don't mash Kevin's question up, uh, I have um, uh, prepared it with an AI voice so that it comes out clean and... Um, unadulterated, if you like. So uh, let's uh, see what the issue is and see if we can um, um, pick it to pieces and put it back together again. Uh, this is from Kevin. In your 428th episode, I was saddened by your response to a listener question asking if space-time itself might be dark matter. I found your emphatic and almost glib, no, just doesn't fit with your regular open-mindedness. I have asked similar questions before in other forums and received the same dismissive, no, response without any depth of thinking about the question. For starters, we don't yet know what space-time actually is. But, if it can be distorted, it has some aspect of a substance to it. And if it is a form of substance, why should it not be considered as a candidate for dark matter? It is everywhere. It is transparent to EM. It is weakly interacting. It can be distorted which means what? That it becomes more dense in some areas than others. So what if areas that are denser have a positive gravitational effect compared to average background space? You might see clumping. So what if areas that are less dense have a repulsive gravitational effect compared to average background space? You might see voids. I'm not saying space-time is dark matter, but dark matter is not actually a thing that has been discovered yet. Variable density space-time may be all that is needed to explain the gravitation anomalies that we observed and I think it deserves a more open-minded level of exploring than a simple dismissal. What I'd like to know is how would you test it as hypothesis? Has anyone done said testing? Has it been exhaustively ruled out? By whom? How did they do that? Otherwise, brilliant show. Kevin from Melbourne. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. I hope you don't mind me using AI to put that question out there. I just wanted to make sure it was intact because um, uh, you, you, you obviously are very serious about this issue. And you um, have had uh, problems in the past getting a straight answer, and you put a lot of thought into it. Uh, I, I, I give you credit for that. So, Fred, um, how can we sort of discuss this question with a with a, a more robust approach? By getting uh, somebody who's more of a specialist in dark matter physics and cosmology than me. Yeah. <laughs> um, as um, uh, as a commentator, I mean, what I report on is what I understand from the work of my colleagues who uh, work in this sort of field. Uh, and there's certainly nothing I've heard and seen in the literature uh, that would equate dark matter with space-time. Um, it is always regarded as something that exists within space-time. Mm. Now there'll be there'll be very good reasons for that, uh, and um, almost certainly, uh, if some of my friends and colleagues were sitting right here now, they would be able to point us in the right direction as to why that is the case. I haven't checked it, the details myself, 
but um, it, nobody is making that suggestion. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's almost universally accepted as being uh, a, a, a subatomic particle of some kind which exists within space-time uh, that we haven't yet detected. Um, I, I, I'd, I'm sorry if I sounded glib, but it wasn't, certainly wouldn't have been my intention. And um, dismissive isn't something I like to be described as either. Uh, because um, you know we we normally um, we normally uh, exactly keep an open mind about many of these issues, and part of that open mindedness is because I'm not a specialist in the field. I'm reporting on what you know what my colleagues, not just one of them, but many of them, uh, are saying. So uh, yeah, let's let's um, keep it keep it in mind. Uh, I will explore it a little bit further. The idea that Jody's going to get involved as well. There we go. Uh, I'll I'll explore. The reasons why um, we don't consider it to be part of space-time um, at a later date. <laughs> okay, no, that's but true thanks, enough. Kevin. I mean, thank, thanks, for, thanks for your comments, Kevin. Yeah, and um, look, I, I appreciate his frustration because he's obviously tried to get answers on this and uh, may not have liked the way we approached it at that particular time. But it is an area that is under heavy investigation. Indeed, yeah. Everyone and is it, looking at it. <laughs> even one or two episodes ago, we talked about uh, a, a particular search for dark matter that came up with nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In fact, we, we know it exists. They just haven't found it within certain parameters. And so they'll be looking bigger. But that particular equipment hasn't actually been built yet. So uh, the 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 frustration continues. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it, we're, we're hopefully a, not, a long way off figuring out dark matter. But right yeah. now, there's there's lots more questions than there are answers. And it's, it's um, I suppose, it's a watch this space scenario. But um, no, we appreciate you um, passing on your thoughts, Kevin. And hopefully, we'll be able to uh, come up with some more information Moving forward, once we've uh, we've looked into it through the uh, respective experts, uh, let's move on to our next question. This comes from Simon, and uh, he says, "Hi, is it possible that the breakdown of models at extremes of the universe is due to our mathematics being flawed, rather than the models? For example, fluid dynamic uh, models of real world scenarios rely on imaginary numbers." Might our system of mathematics be slightly misaligned with the real world? Thank you, Simon. Uh, I, I think we've kind of talked about the mathematics being off uh, in respect to some things in the past, and even Einstein considers the model of relativity is probably not right, even though we can't prove it wrong. So it is a good question to ask, and the answer is, yeah, probably somewhere along the line the, the numbers don't stack up. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting, uh, you know, Simon's postulate about, particularly about imag imaginary numbers, um, which is, uh, we call them complex numbers. They have an, a real and an, and an imaginary component. Uh, why is it imaginary? Because it's the square root of minus one, uh, which doesn't exist. Um, so, uh, but it's a incredibly useful tool in so many fields of science. Um, and engineering too. Uh, your aerodynamics relies on imaginary numbers, so it's imaginary numbers that keep your plane in the air. Um, could could that understanding be flawed? Yes, I, I think it could. I, and again, I think you know we we are pretty open minded about this idea. Um, what breaks down our physics um, in the extreme situations that I think Simon's referring to? Things like you know, how do you deal with um, uh, the way the universe behaved immediately after the Big Bang, where you've got temperatures and pressures that we've got no physical experience of uh, in terms of working out how how they would behave, uh, and they become what we call highly nonlinear. That means that they they behave in a way that is actually really hard to predict, uh, and so um, that's saying that our physical models are, are not are not uh, robust enough. Um, mm. uh, not necessarily that the mathematics is not robust enough, uh, but it is an interesting conjecture. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I 
think uh, Simon's point is well made. Uh, might our system of mathematics be slightly misaligned with the real world? Well, in extreme cases, it probably is when you think about, you know, the temperature immediately after the Big Bang. Well, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I mean, it's no easy remedy, though, is there? Um, no. Um, I mean, uh, there are people who are modelling those scenarios where you do have these extremes, and they're probably relying on relatively conventional mathematics, although, yes, you know, they, inv they will involve complex numbers and all the rest of it. Uh, but I, yeah, I think it... it, it gets weirdest actually it gets weirder uh in um in the quantum world where we've got uh all kinds of uh interesting notions that do rely heavily on mathematics superposition entanglement all of these things um and they rely on particular types of mathematics uh, hilbert spaces and things of that sort which are uh well understood i have to say but to you know, to uh, the uneducated, and I include myself in that, because um, mathematics was my Achilles heel at university. Uh, nearly cost me my degree. Uh, oh. the, um, the, 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 I think they look, these things look like mathematics gone wrong, if I can put it that way, but they have, they're, they're well understood. Mm. So um, the misalignment with the real world, uh, I, I, I think it's possible, um, but in many ways, the mathematics is all we've got to rely on, so we just keep plodding on with what we know. Yeah. You mentioned superposition. Now, I've just finished watching a science fiction series called Dark Matter. Right. And uh, they, uh, the, the goal of the, the main character, the, the scientist that was the, the, the whole story was built around, uh, his aim was to achieve superposition so, oh, that he could, so that he could travel interdimensionally. It was, yes. it was, uh, it was brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. They, they, they obviously had to work, work out how to make it a convincing storyline for those who are so into science fiction and science, for that matter, to make it plausible. And they did a great job. It's a brilliant story. Brilliant series. Really enjoyed it. Won't, uh, won't uh, spoil it by telling you how it ended. But there was. I doubt there'll be a sequel because it did end, okay. <laughs> and it did end well. I thought, mm. right? Okay, what Simon. It, what was it called again? Dark matter. Dark matter. Okay. Dark matter. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was on Netflix. Can't remember now, but um, yeah, terrific series. Really enjoyed it. Uh, and just so it, you know, they could have. Well, they did. They, it, it got so very confusingly complicated towards the end, but. Um, yeah, that's what made it so interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Simon. And our next question coming up in a moment. Let's take a break from the show to tell you about our sponsor, Incogni. And I'll be giving you a special Space Nuts URL so you can get up to 60% off Incogni. But first, what's Incogni all about? Uh, it's a way of cleaning up your online presence and reducing the risk of your personal information being sold to unscrupulous people via the dark web or just via a hacker who's trying to fleece you or other people. It's also a great way to reduce spam emails and spam phone calls, reduce the risk of identity theft, which is big business these days. I think, most significantly, it greatly reduces your risk of being scammed. And that is just such a viral thing that's happening around the world at the moment. So how does all this work? Well, it's simple. All you have to do is sign up to Incogni, give them permission to act on your behalf, and they'll do the rest. They'll trawl the internet and remove your personal information from the web, the stuff that can be found on search engines, public websites, even private databases. It's all easily accessible, and let's face it, are uh, you really going to be able to clean up the entire world wide web of your personal information by yourself? Right now, Incogni is offering a significant discount for Space Nuts listeners, up to 60% off, and that comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. Just go to incogni.com slash space nuts. That's I N C O G N I, incogni.com slash space nuts to find out more and they have special prices for students and graduates as well 
make your personal information much harder to find online with Incogni. Check out all their plans today at incogni.com slash space nuts. Now, back to the show. Roger, your lives are here also. Space nuts. And that's a moment. Uh, this one, this one's from um, Isaac uh, on uh, the Gold Coast. Uh, he's from Brisbane, actually, in, um, in Australia. Uh, Isaac is nine years old. He said, I have two questions. How do black holes spin if they take up no space? And why does spin affect space? Um, and and his dad's got a question as well. Uh, my dad asks, how does gravity bend space and thus bend light traveling past it? Uh, Isaac in Brisbane, nine years old. Great to hear from you, Isaac. Thanks for sending your questions in. Why do black holes spin? I think someone else asked a similar we question did, yeah. recently. We, yeah. we covered this not very long ago. Yeah. Um, and so what, what you've got to think about is how black, fo- black holes are formed. If you have um, a star which is more than, you know, 10 times the mass of the sun, something like that, gets to the end of its life, the, the nuclear propulsion system of the star stops and so gravity takes over and the star collapses or its its, uh, core collapses to become a black hole. So um, what you've got is a star that is is going to be spinning. It will rotate because everything is rotating or evolving. Uh, And uh, as it rotates, uh, the spin will get faster because of the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, So spin is conserved. So even when the black hole becomes something that, as as uh, Isaac says, takes up no space, um, it's still spinning. Even mm. though it is a single point, uh, it's still spinning because it's uh, the original star that collapsed to form it was spinning. So that spin gets imparted to the black hole. So it's just inherited, basically. It's a, yes, that's right. It's a good way of putting it, an inherited spin. Um, I, think, I think I've got that as well. Uh, so, and um, Isaac's dad wants to know how gravity bends space. We all want to know that, actually. Yeah. Uh, because um, it's uh, w- what we know is is how much it bends space. We do understand the mechanics of uh, what happens when you put mass there. You you can you can accurately predict just how and how much um, space will be bent. But why does it happen? It's a it's uh, the effect of gravity. That's the phenomenon we call gravity. And at that level, we really don't understand it very well. Mm. So, yeah, this is the thing. We know dark matter exists. We can't prove it yet. Uh, we know gravity exists, but we don't know much about how it exists in the way it exists and whether or not it's a subatomic particle called a graviton. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, we know a lot of things that exist, but we don't know much about why they exist and how they exist. Yeah, I, I, I suppose what you could say is that we know extremely accurately, and this was, you know, one of your, your answers to that last question. Relativity works like a dream. Everything is so precise, mm. uh, following the rules that Einstein laid out in 1915. Um, uh, so that describes gravity incredibly well, incredibly accurately, but it is still only a description of gravity. It's not an understanding of how gravity arises. Yeah, uh, and so yes, we still we still have big mysteries there, relatively speaking. Indeed, uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Isaac. Uh, great to hear from you. Please uh, send us questions again. Uh, always love to hear from our uh, younger listeners. Uh, and finally, we have uh, a question from our old mate Rusty. I believe Rusty's from Donnybrook. G'day, Fred and Andrew, and all you space nuts. It's Rusty in Donnybrook, Western Australia. It seems to me that soon, and that may be in astronomical terms, we'll be able to harness the energy of space itself. We know there's a lot of energy in space. It has most of it, if you look at at the expanding universe and and dark energy. But... uh, when we do harness the energy energy of space, we should be able to crank up one G drives at, that allow us to go anywhere we like with uh, 
a swap over halfway. So the first half of the voyage is accelerating at 1G and the second half is decelerating at 1G. A funny thing happens, the crew uh, to them seem to be travelling faster than the speed of light so that they would go to Andromeda under these uh, circumstances in 30 crew years. So uh, just wondering what, Fred and Andrew, what your priorities would be once we do develop this drive, both for the solar system and in the wider universe. Thank you. Oh, Rusty, just put us right there in the middle of it. Um, what would our priorities be? Um, over to you, Fred. Well, uh, I kind of said this before, and it's um, something that almost, you know, Rusty's almost hinted at by referring to a trip to Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, the the view of our own galaxy from the outside is what I'd really like to see. I'd oh, love yeah. to know how close our models are. Just what, to make sure you've got the got. colour right. The colour, how many spiral arms it's got, uh, you know, what, what... Don't we know that? No, not really. We think yeah. it's a four-arm spiral, which is quite unusual. Um, so, to, to, you know, there's a, there's a bar across the middle, what we call a bar in the galaxy, not one you lean up against, but one that you... Uh, uh, you know, a bit like a, a rod or something like that that's that's made of stars. And from the, each end of the bar, it looks as though there are two spiral arms that emerge. And that's based on mapping that we can do from the inside of the galaxy. But just imagine what it would look like if you're on the outside of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great... Yeah, I, I never contemplated that, to be honest. I know you've mentioned it before. I, I'd probably go further. I'd probably like to um, sort of get right away from our um i suppose galactic cluster and and look at the whole thing i mean i don't know how to explain it but um yeah i'd i'd like to be able to have in my view andromeda and the milky way and whatever else is in the vicinity you know um i'm i'm assuming there are great voids between galaxy clusters yeah, and I'd like to get out into one of them, looking back at our galaxy cluster. I suppose that's what I'm saying. I think that would be fascinating, just to see it all in one picture. Yes, yes, that's right. So I think um, so. We're mem um, the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are the two biggest members of what we call the local group, uh, which is about thirty galaxies there thereabouts. Mm. Um, the next biggest one is the Triangulum Galaxy, uh, and then there's lots of small stuff. But we're part of a bigger um, cluster. I think it's the Virgo cluster that we're part of. I, I, I'm shocking at not remembering that, uh, that we're a, a little bit of that. It was certainly one of the bigger galaxy clusters we're part of as well. So you want to get right outside that and see what it looks like and be able to point to our Milky Way and say, that's home. Folks, yeah. That's home. Yeah. I mean, that's probably very unexciting to most people. I'm sure others have. Um, thought, oh, okay, well, if I could get a 1G drive, what I would do is this. Um, maybe they can let us know. But, uh, I, I, yeah, if we could achieve 1G drive, it would make travel around the solar system pretty schmick, wouldn't it? It would. Um, it's, um, it, it is, uh, it's a nice concept because you you do two things. You, you give your spacecraft a, a long period of constant acceleration but if you make it 1G, then you've you've also provided your spacecraft with artificial gravity. Um, so it means that everybody can you know can stand upright on the bottom of the spacecraft as it's accelerating. Yeah. So the, the, the end away from the uh, the end of, away from the sorry the way, the end away from the pointy bit, uh, the the, um, the the bottom of your capsule. Uh, that the, the acceleration would would mean that you were you were actually kept there at the, exactly the same weight as you have on Earth. And then if you switched it around to slow down at the other end of your trip, you'd have 1G uh, also decelerating you. So it's a really neat idea if ever it can be made to work. Do you think it could work? Uh, yes, well, it, it could. Um, but the main issue is sustaining it for a long period. That's why no. it's something that we haven't done yet. Maybe ion drive engines that or that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that people think of. Yeah, could be interesting. Thank you, Rusty. As always, you you pulled one out of the uh, the big black box, 
it's um, yeah, he's always got a bit of a curveball for us, has Rusty. Uh, yeah, nice yeah. to hear from you. Uh, that uh, is the end of this particular episode. Uh, if you would like to ask our questions of Fred, uh, by all means, go to our website, spacenutspodcast.com. Spacenuts.io is the other URL. I'll both take you to the same place. You just click on the AMA tab at the top. And when you go in there, it gives you the option to send us a text or audio question. If you've got a device with a microphone, it's as easy as saying, hi, I'm Fred from Sydney and I want to know. Uh, and away you go. Try that. Um, and if you're not named Fred, you can send us questions too. Just tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you, now, especially if you've contemplated sending a question and you've been a bit reluctant. There are no dumb questions in astronomy and space science, so yeah, please, please do uh, get onto uh, our website and send us some questions ASAP. Uh, we're done, Fred. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. It's uh, always a pleasure, Andrew, and we'll talk again soon. We will, possibly in the next few days. Who knows? Uh, that's Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hugh in the studio is just being Hugh in the studio today. Actually, I think he's being um, the guy who picks up the kids from school, Hugh in the studio. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. We'll catch you again real soon on another episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.